Hi, this is Teddy, and you're listening to Kate Rice on Two Broad Talking Politics, part of the Debcast Podcast Network. Everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast family of podcasts, and I am on today with Kate Rice, who is the author of How the Refugee Crisis Unites Americans, the untold story of the grassroots movement shattering our red and blue silos. Hi, Kate. Hi, Kelly. So nice to be able to talk to you. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, you too. So I, I want to talk all about this book, uh, which I think is so great in light of everything that is happening in the country right now. Uh, but I want to sort of take a step backwards and, and talk a little bit about you and sort of how, how you got to the place where you were writing this book. So so tell me a little bit about this. You're a, you were a travel writer? Yep. I'm from Sparta, Wisconsin, uh, but I came to New York to go to grad school. And it turned out New York is actually, even though I moved from the small town to the big city, New York, I discovered was part of my family history, because back in the 1850s, two sets of my grandparents had emigrated from Ireland and met and married in New York City, Mm -hmm. and then followed the railroad out to Wisconsin. And they're kind of one reason why I realized after I wrote the book, or when I was almost done with writing the book, why I felt so intensely uh, about people being able to come to America, because They, one of them fled famine. They both were fleeing famine in Ireland, but one had, he and his brother, my great, great, great grandfather, I guess, he and his brother had had a dispute with their mother's landlord. And as, as my aunt Mary Ellen used to say, after the dispute, the landlord was dead Mm -hmm. and they fled. And so they were not necessarily, they didn't come with the most pristine record, but they came and and made a new life in the new country and um, I think contributed a lot to the country. So, and then my grandparents actually had hosted um, a couple from Eastern Europe who had been in a displaced persons camp in World War II. And then when I was growing up as a kid in Sparta, I had to go to Catholic school in the summer because my parents sent me and my siblings to public school. So every summer we'd have to spend two weeks going to St. Pat's, but the nuns would take us out to read to the migrant workers, to read to the children of the migrant workers who came up every summer to work the fields. And and then in 1980, the Mariel boat lift happened where 125,000 Cuban refugees fled Cuba and landed on the shores of Florida, and 15,000 of them got processed at Fort McCoy, which was like down the road from where I grew up. And actually, my parents' cottage sat on the boundary of Fort McCoy. And my father, who was then Um, the judge in Monroe County, Jim Rice, actually got very involved in saving kids who were unaccompanied minors and very vulnerable to some of the, um, because remember, or you probably don't remember, but Castro had, some of the people were regular refugees just fleeing, but Castro had also emptied the prisons and mental institutions. So there were some nasty people there and there were some vulnerable kids there. And dad was very instrumental in letting it be known that he couldn't do anything for the kids when they were on Fort McCoy, because that was federal property. And he was, you know, a Wisconsin judge, but get them off the, out of, off the fort and onto, into the state of Wisconsin. And then he could take care of them, connect them with relative, place them with relatives or put them in foster homes. And so I had all that in my head or like in me, but I wasn't really thinking about it a lot. And then fast forward, I moved to New York, go to grad school, meet a guy, we get married, have kids. I have this great job where first I was working, where I get to travel all over the world. I worked for a UK magazine and then for a bunch of US travel magazines that go to travel agents. So I was writing about travel and travel for travel agents who are mostly women entrepreneurs. So it was really fun. I took my, my kids went everywhere. And life was pretty fun. And, you know, you're busy, you're working, you got to do the laundry, which doesn't always get folded. (laughs) 
<laughs> and, uh, and you know, you're making costumes for the kids in the school play and volunteering at the library. But there was stuff going on that really bothered me. Like the civil war in Syria was, was one thing. Um, and, but you know, what was I going to do? Like go land with a bunch of green berets. <laughs> Not, I, so I didn't do anything and I was, I was busy, but then 2015 happens and refugees flood Europe. And then that's when I was like, Oh, now I can do something. America is the land that takes in refugees. This is something I can do. So I called up my synagogue um, because my kid's father is Jewish. And so we raised them as Jews and I said, well, what can we do? And um, they're like, well, I, we don't have anything going yet, but give us your number. And like within days, I was on the B'nai Jeshurun refugee committee. And, <laughs> and, and what was, what was interesting was even though there were people on the committee who had been very active in refugee resettlement years earlier, who had helped, you know, many families from like Vietnam resettle, it was a whole different ball game. Uh, and we, we really had to learn. We just had to start completely over. We didn't know, we had no idea what we were doing. So, uh, and at the same time, I got involved with a church that was just a block from my house, Rutgers Presbyterian. And while we were still trying to figure out where to go, they actually were already sponsoring a Syri a family from Syria, like a family, a young couple with three kids. And they had helped them find an apartment. They had helped the dad get a driver's license in the New Jersey so he could work. The mother was a fabulous cook and was making cooked dinners, making community dinners. Um, the records rents out office space to different small enterprises. One is a, which is a cookbook publishing company. So the mother published a cookbook, which you can find <laughs> at, you can find it at the bread and salt between us.org. And, um, so people were calling them and saying, how, how can he do this? And I kept saying, you guys have to write this down. And they were too busy. And all of a sudden I thought, Oh, I'm a reporter. I get. I guess I could write this stuff. So that's how I got going. I love it. And you know, it, as you're talking about how you know, growing up, you you knew about refugees, and and this was the place where where people came. Uh, and you know, that's that's my experience of growing up. I grew up in Ohio, so not that far from Wisconsin, and. You know, yeah, and this is, this is the country people come to. This is the place they came to, to, uh, you know, find a new life, to make something better. You don't have to go very far back in, in my family to find, uh, people coming to escape bad circumstances. Has that changed? Is that different now? Or is it just sort of the, the rhetoric that's different, but a lot of the, the people on the ground are, still think of it the same way? You know, what, what's been your experience in, in going around and talking to people for, uh, to research for this book? My experience is at the grassroots level, it's, it's what it always was. Um, at the grassroots level, it's very unifying and, and I intentionally went to, I, I, I intentionally looked in red, in the Bible belt in red states because thanks to those nuns, I knew that there was going to be a lot of work in places that people wouldn't normally, ex like, like my neighbors on the Upper West Side wouldn't normally expect. And it's all people, much of it is faith based because churches and religious congregations in general are, are often very community oriented. And a lot of it, I talked to, uh, people in like Kentucky where they're like, Jesus said, take care of the stranger. And people said stuff like, and, and when I, I was raised Catholic and we just studied the catechism, our catechisms, I didn't study the Bible. So I don't really know the Bible, but a, a woman who's a Southern Baptist said, and Jesus did not predicate who he served on what they believed. That he didn't care about it. And if that was good enough for Jesus, that's good enough for me. And so there, there, for some people, it was very definitely faith based. Um, and for other people, it was just, it was just their belief of what America is. And everywhere I went, I found people of very different beliefs all working together. So 
the motivations varied, but to really get to your question, is it the same attitude that you grew up with and I grew up with? I think yes. Yeah. Then how, how do these people, do these people reconcile uh, feeling this way, wanting to help people, bring people in the, due to the, the least of their brethren, everything that, you know, they're reading in the Bible with voting for an administration that actively wants to keep people out? You know, is there, is there a disconnect there? Or, you know, are they thinking through those sorts of issues? Uh, and, you know, what, what might that mean going forward? Well, it varies. There was one man I interviewed who voted for Trump and, but he's super active in help, in helping the community in all sorts of ways. And he said, I just don't deal with it at the policy level. I just deal with it on the local level. So that's one way of dealing with it. Just very, you know, just setting boundaries on how you work. Then there was another woman, a very devout Catholic, who who truly opposed abortion. And, you know, I get it. If that's her feeling, I completely respect it. But she said, when I looked at it, Hillary, once you got outside the womb, Hillary Clinton was the pro-life candidate. And so that's who I voted for. So some people actually changed their vote. And then, interestingly, like I interviewed... Gary Herbert, who is the governor of Utah, and Utah is very pro-refugee, partly because of the, you know, the Bible says to help the stranger, but partly because Mormons were refugees who fled to Utah because they were getting burned out of their homes in Nauvoo, Illinois, and there's, there's a whole big history there, but they truly consider themselves refugees, and that's why they really open their arms to refugees. Mormons are very, you know, they're very much, they're very active in sending out missionaries to convert people. But when it comes to refugees, it's totally hands off. And so Gary Herbert actually, you know, with all these, all, like so many other Republican jump governors jumped on the anti-refugee bandwagon and he was welcoming refugees. And last fall, he sent a letter to President Trump saying, please send Utah more refugees. We need more. And I said, well, how do you rec- how do you reconcile that? And he would, he, he, it was very simple for him. He said, some stuff I agree with Trump on, some of the stuff he does makes it easier for me to run my state. But on this, I disagree with him. And, you know, so those were just three reactions. If you really want to delve into this, there's a podcast called Straight White American Jesus, where it's two former evangelicals who are now professors of religion. And they, they really explain how, A, what forms the opinions of the super conservative religious who seem to, you know, it's, it's hard to understand how they can so embrace a man whose lifestyle is the antithesis of what they believe, but they do a great job of explaining it and also talking about just the cognitive dissonance that, that makes it that we all deal with, that we all struggle with. Do you think that, uh, do you think that there's something in this issue that might help, uh, you know, a lot of us sort of think about how do we bridge divides? How do we, how do we get back to a place where people are not, you know, fighting red versus blue, but, you know, instead are trying to, to work together to solve problems, even if they have differences of opinion. Do you think that, uh, that welcoming, accepting, helping refugees is, is one place that, that we can start to, to mend that a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one reason I'm, that's one reason I wrote the book. If people talk to each other, if they meet people who are different from them, be it just Republicans meeting Democrats or an evangelical kid meeting a Muslim refugee, there are a lot of congregations delved pretty deeply into it. Um, and, and had a lot of conversations about how to handle differences. I did meet in Arkansas where a group there, uh, Canopy Northwest Arkansas, CanopyNWA.org, which has a great website that would probably be a good resource for people to look at about about their model. But they had a lot of internal conversations with people in the group about their differences. And through them, um, I met, I heard stories about students, college students who really wanted to help, but they'd never met anyone who is Muslim. They'd actually been raised in churches that if that were at least 
wary of Muslims, if not actually anti-Islam, but the experience of actually working with refugees who were Muslim totally opened up the world to them. So I do think this is an issue that can not only be make build bridges between people, but can also transform people. Did you notice any sort of differences in the way people uh, did or didn't accept refugees based on where the refugees were coming from? You know, we we have all this rhetoric right now in our our politics about the southern border, uh, and then there's of course the the travel ban trying to keep out Muslim refugees. You know, it, was that at all uh, an important piece of any of this, or or did it not really matter? It really did not matter. No group really cared. Well, a lot of groups wanted to have a Syrian refugee just because there was so much publicity about the terrible plight that they were in, but it really didn't matter. I do know one group, it was a Catholic church in Pleasanton, California, where when they first started, and they worked with a couple of families from Afghanistan, and they did have people say, oh, we're not getting a Christian family. And one of the women were like, it's not like you call up Sears catalog and order them. Which <laughs> <laughs> was great. But no, it wasn't. It was just anybody who was in need. There really didn't seem to be from, I think I talked to groups in nine different cities and not at all. That I think is, uh, is super hopeful <laughs> in a way, you know, I, I feel like there's so much othering that goes on. And it's nice to think that, um, that when you look at it more closely, that, that people really see each other as, as human beings, uh, in, you know, who maybe just need a little bit of a helping hand for a little bit. Uh, so it's, it's nice to hear that that sort of rhetoric that is so popular sort of nationally isn't actually taking root in these groups. I know. I love it. It's just that this issue that is so divisive in the headlines is so unifying on the ground. It's it's really cool. So how do we sort of use some of what you learned uh, to move forward? You know, you say there's an opportunity here uh, to, to start bringing people together to help people see each other. Would you have ideas for sort of what... I like to have action steps. <laughs> right. What do we do next? How do we make this work? So what what can we do either at at the local level in our own communities or what could we be thinking about in terms of a more national policy based thing that might be helpful? Okay, there's lots. First of all, one thing I realized after I wrote the book is just the way our political landscape has been changing. This is is really not refugees. It's an immigration issue. It's immigrants who are immigrants, documented, undocumented refugees, asylum seekers, dreamers. And everything, all of the people who I talked to had basically set up scalable models that could be used to help any of these groups, either for helping refugees who are here already and need help or to advocate. So um, here's where places people can go. One new place that act, one new avenue for people that's kind of new and I don't cover in the book because I didn't discover it until afterwards and it's a mo- growing movement is business immigration coalitions. There's a national one called, um, the American Business Immigration Coalition, ABIC.us, I think, because business need, businesses really want workers to be able to come to this country and are lobbying the government to let more workers in. So you can, first of all, look for one in your area. They're all over the place and just Google business immigration coalition. Uh, And even Fox, Fox business actually covered a survey that the construction industry did that it used as um, a rationale for it to lobby the Trump administration to work on improving the immigration immigration regulations because the construction business doesn't have enough, enough workers And they also have numbers about like the Texas Business Immigration Coalition um, publicized a story that actually ran in a newspaper. I'm not sure who did it, where it talked about the amount of money and taxes that immigrants pay. And like 40 percent of those immigrants were undocumented. So business is actually one option. Um, The other thing to do is go to any of um, the the main refugee resettlement agencies that work with volunteers and they work, you know, there's, they're nationwide, but 
depending on where you are, that that will vary. But they include Catholic Charities, which is the group that my synagogue worked with the most here in New York. There's also HIAS, which used to be the um, Hebrew Immigration Aid Immigrant Aid Society, but now it's just HIAS that helps everyone. Um, World Relief, which I love because it is actually the refugee resettlement agency backed by the National Association for Evangelicals. So it's the evangelical one, which I, I like because evangelicals are so seen as being so solidly Trump voters. There's IRC, the International Rescue Committee, a Luth- the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, and Church World Service. Um, Google them. Um, they are very understaffed because as the, they, they do get government funding, but, um, as the refugee headcounts drops, so does their funding. And we've gone from a hundred thousand a year to just 18,000. So it does take a little bit of work. Um, most states actually have a refugee resettlement agency because federal money is funneled through the states. And for instance, I just looked up. I forget what the one is in Wisconsin, but there's there you can find them. So what you can do is you can find groups that are already working with refugees. There's plenty of refugees here right now who do need help. Um, it and it's good to try to find a group that you can work with that you can work with the group on because it can take a lot of energy. To, to help a family and families also sort of cycle in and out. I mean, they're doing fine and then they have another baby or the dad um, needs help with a job or a kid needs a little help with homework or something. Um, and you can help on a variety of levels. You can go full bore and just like you're the one who takes them to doctor appointments. Maybe you're busy, but that you can be on the too busy to do something like that. But you can be on the mailing list. So when a family needs things, you get the Amazon wish list and you pick the stuff that you're going to um, that, that you can buy for the family. So there's all sorts of different things that you can do. You Advocacy is becoming in, increasingly important. Canopy NWA, which I mentioned earlier, actually put together a coalition of 20 people who went to Washington to, to lobby Arkansas representatives to talk to to lobby President Trump to increase the numbers of refugees admitted. I mean, you know, that's not going to happen. But now if if a congressional delegation gets 20 people coming to Washington to talk them up to them about an, an issue that these people, you know, they flew here on their own dime. That's really telling. Um, and so those are so, just some ideas of stuff that you can do right now. It, do, it does take a little digging just because when you call the refugee resettlement agencies, they're really busy. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they've got somebody sitting there with a pen and paper <laughs> who could take down your name and number and where to call you. But I, I mean, but they totally want your, they, and they need our help more than ever. Uh, and they can connect you with groups that they're already working with. For example, in Wisconsin, there's the International Institute of Wisconsin, which is part of the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, where you can go to try to figure out where to help people and uh, Lutheran Social Services. But definitely, I'll send all of these so you can keep them in, put them in the show notes. And uh, if people would like to pick up your book uh, and read more about these uh, incredible stories that you were able to capture, how, how can they get a hold of your book? Well, right now it's it's available right now on Amazon and right now just as an ebook, but it's coming out in both hard copy and as an audio book um, on Audible. And very soon it'll just be available wherever books are sold. Thank you for asking. Yes, excellent. Uh, and we'll put a link up to the ebook and then you'll have to let us know when it's available in hard copy and audio so we can let people know that as well. Absolutely. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, so, Kate, is there anything else that you would like to make sure that we talk about today? Well, one thing is, um, I want, I think people should keep listening to podcasts like yours because they're very energizing. You just hear a lot of really exciting people talk positively about some of the very kind of scary things that we're living in today. And I just think just Action is the best antidote to anxiety. (laughs) So the three A's here. So uh, I I could, that was because I was thinking about it. What if they asked me that question? And I truly think it's so important 
to listen to podcasts, to get involved, and just know that just the smallest thing can actually make a difference. And also this sort of work is so enriching and life-changing. I have a whole new circle of friends, both the families that I've worked with and the people I met through working with them. It's just super energizing and rewarding. I love that. Uh, and I hope that everyone will, uh, will in fact go get involved. I think this is such a needed and sometimes so overlooked uh, right now. There's so much else going on and it's, it, you know, obviously yeah. there's good reasons that people get overwhelmed with everything else because there's a lot to get overwhelmed with. Um, but I, you know, I think that this is really a way that people can, can help in a, a super meaningful way. Cool. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. And it leads to other stuff too. You just end up branching out and finding out doing, you're doing more of other things as well. All right. Well, Kate, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for this uplifting message. I love the idea that there are ways that in fact, we are not quite as siloed as we think we are and can come back together. Oh, absolutely. Kelly, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at twobroadstalkingpolitics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.